And I was really convinced that people got sick because of what they thought and felt. And that we had infinitely more choice and control over it. That we, uh, naturopathy taught me I don't have to wait to get sick to take care of my health. And I think we have a world that thinks you've got to be sick before you're worthy of health care. And, and that, Charlie, was a turning thought process for me. Because I went, this life is not about remediating, it's about creating. That was Alan Parker, and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. From wherever we are, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, recognising their continuing connection to this land, its waterways, the stars in the skies since time immemorial. We pay our respects to the elders, knowledge holders and to all the generations of First Nations peoples who have nurtured their unceded sovereign lands for over 80,000 years and continue to do so today. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott, an 8th generational Australian regenerative farmer. And in this podcast series, I'll be diving deep and exploring my guests' unique perspectives on the world so you can apply their experience and knowledge to cultivate your own transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with your host, Charlie Arnott. G'day, welcome back to The Regenerative Journey, and excuse me again for the possible echoing that's carrying on in this the office here at the farm, Byron Bay, but very grateful to have the spot to do our little uh, intro again. Um, today's guest, this episode, you're, you're currently listening to, is for Alan Parker, A-L-L-A-N, not A-L-L-E-N, or A-L-A-N, or A-L-E-N. <clears throat> Does anyone spell the name A-L-E-N? I'm not sure. But Alan doesn't. It's A L L A N, and I say that because <laughs> he's just fantastic. Um, it's how we started the interview um, from memory. A couple of things I want to just prod in your direction, push in your direction. Our webinar series, of course, you've probably heard that um, already in this episode up front. Keen to get you to our um, webinar series, <clears throat> our eight-week series plus the farm tour. Um, what I do have to say that I haven't mentioned yet is we've got some extra value to give to you guys via the guest speakers themselves, their own products and services. Um, a num- number of discounts. Cherie Gooding, um, for instance, is doing a 20% off any initial consults online or in person. Um, this is for people who've actually um, booked into the into the webinar series. Um, they are um, uh, they qualify for these discounts. Uh, Kim Deans is kindly um, doing a 10% discount on enrolments into the Farm Financial Foundations online course. Um, that she runs, and Cindy O'Meara is doing a free introduction to a nutrition course. It's valued at uh, just under $200 um, and 10% off her book uh, for those that sign up for the series. <clears throat> so three three that I can announce at this point in time. <clears throat> if you add all that, all those discounts up, you're probably looking at uh, um, at a saving of what, what the value of the, of the, of the, online, <laughs> the online workshop is anyway. So you'd be mad not to join us um, starting on the 16th of August with um, Nicole Masters. So get online because uh, we will be switching out um, the uh, early bird tickets to the full price at some stage. Um, so don't take any risks and having to pay more than you might want to or could or can. Um, and make sure you grab a ticket to the farm, um, the farm day as well. The full day of um, feasting, uh, somewhat entertainment, um, demonstrations, presentations, and a farm tour. Um, our BD workshops, are of course, are running around the country. Um, check out charlianet.com.au for your nearest workshop. Um, I want to give a quick, <clears throat> well, not sh- well, I guess shout out to those who've given me some beautiful, wonderful feedback on the episodes to date. Excuse me, Nicole Masters. I mean, actually kicking off with them. Angelica and I seem to strike a chord with people. Um, Angelica's um, very oh, oh, sensible. No, it's not quite the right word. Just insightful conversation um, that she always brings to the table is fantastic. Nicole Masters, Kim Deans, you're listening to this and you would have heard Clive Bircham. Uh, no, Scott Gooding. Scott Gooding. Um, so I don't know about Scott's yet because not out. But Clive came out today. Um, who else is in there in the mix? I've... Um, I've hope, not hopefully, <clears throat> I've potentially forgotten because there's a long, long, beautiful list of people that are 
have already, <clears throat> excuse me, have already been released. But we're getting some beautiful feedback. I love it. I was chatting with someone the other day, having a, a moment of not honesty because I like to think I'm pretty honest all the time. But I was chatting with um, someone the other day who might listen to this and know who I'm talking about. And I said, I just said, talking about my bandwidth for the for the podcast. I wasn't going to talk about this, but it's come up. Um, and I was just thinking, you know what? I love doing the podcast. <clears throat> it's such a wonderful thing. I get to meet some amazing people. I get to capture, hear and capture amazing stories that, you know, I generally haven't heard before. Um, and often the people who unsuspecting maybe or <clears throat> just, I don't know, everyone's got an amazing story. There's not one person that I've interviewed that doesn't have a, have challenges that they're sharing or trials and tribulations. Um, and I was just saying, look, you know, I've got a lot on my plate. And um, it was two people I was talking to at the time, sort of together and then separately. And I said, look, I'm just not sure what, <clears throat> you know, what longevity the podcast has. I haven't got a clear plan for it. I'm not looking, you know, that, well, I'm not looking five years into the future. I'm thinking about next year. I'm thinking about how that comes about. But anyway, I was just flagging that um, it was something that is on my plate that is I love doing. It takes a lot of time. There's a fair bit of cost involved and it's it's a, it's becoming challenging to juggle because, <clears throat> as you know, all my interviews, not bar one to this point, and I don't know how many we're up to now, 80, 90, something, um, which is not that many episodes considering a lot of other podcasts around, you know, but given the fact that I've interviewed every single one <clears throat> at their place of work, their house, their farm, their whatever, you know, it does take a lot of time. And um, as I said, I love doing it, but I was just thinking, you know, what if, <clears throat> what if I stopped doing it? And it was lovely. It was really heart heartwarming to that both those people did not hesitate in saying, don't stop doing it. It was lovely. I mean, I get good lawyers get good feedback, but I guess what I got from that response was that it's important. You know, people get a lot out of it. Um, I think, I hope, I trust. I got I got a lot out of it as well. <clears throat> and um, you know, I think we've done it right. We've done we've got, you know, like two out of the last three years we've the last three years we've we've put in um uh applied that's is that sorry, just to break up the, the the soft, squishy moment there. That bird you can hear is son of Robert. So Bobby, Bob the, the rooster here at the farm, was a legend. He'd been here for years and years and years. Anyway, Robert spread his oats one night or day and um, as a result, young young Robert Jr. appeared. And you know, Bobby died a couple of months ago and um, just a splitting image. So you can hear young Robert there in the background. Back to it though. Um, where the hell was I there? Yes, it was lovely to hear, and I get lovely feedback, but I was really quite, not stern, but but um, lovely <clears throat> lovely uh, insistence almost to don't stop doing it, and that's wonderful to hear. And I'm not going to stop doing it, just not in the immediate future anyway. We have got season seven to roll out, and I'm having a hell of a lovely, wonderful time doing it. Um, very grateful for our, our series, our season partners, Highland Beef, um, we, you'll be hearing more from them and from me about them uh, in subsequent episodes. We're doing some special little betweener episodes, um, talking with the guys there at Highland Beef and a few guests, so that's going to be really exciting. Uh, there's lots going on in the beef industry that I think is very topical, and it's not just topics that sort of relate to beef. It's about environment. It's about economy. It's about risk. It's about all sorts of things, so really can do um, – to get to those episodes and roll them out with the lovely team at High and Beef. Um, probably enough about everything else except for Alan A-L-L-A-N Parker. He is a legend. I've got to say, I've been involved with RCS Australia for many years, back when, you know, 15, 18 years ago. Alan was appeared at one of their conferences and I subsequently did as a speaker and then I did a his negotiator toolkit workshop, I think twice over the sort of, you know, five, six, seven years. He is a neuroscientist. He is amazing. He is not a young rooster, is Alan. Um, but I tell you what, he is. He would run rings around most people I know and probably myself. Um, so he's an amazing, vital, vibrant man. 
Um, caught up with him at his um, his, his apartment uh, up in the Tweed, just north of Byron Bay, where I currently am. And um, he talks about human. He's just so insightful about human behaviour, about gesticulation, about you know, I guess influence, about um, uh, relationship, about succession planning, about um, just connection. And, and throughout, obviously, the conversation. We we talked about his his growth, his life, his journey, um, and he <laughs> he's bloody funny too. We sat up there quite precariously on the on the back on the balcony of his unit, overlooking an amazing um, golf course and 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 trees and grass and all sorts of cool stuff. But yeah, <laughs> and the wind the wind might have got the better of us at some point. I think I might have spilled my water too. Uh, I can't remember if that was recorded or was before or after we. <laughs> We did it. It was very, very funny. We did also do a and a So anyone who wants to listen to that Q&A, which is where often the um, the, the gold lies, um, fortunately for those Patreon members who, who, who well, people who are Patreon members, you get to listen to that. Uh, so if you want to sign up for Patreon, uh, go to charliearnett.com.au forward slash Patreon. I think it's on there. Well, certainly podcast. You'll find it. Sign up, 10 bucks a month. It's awesome. And I trust I trust it is because those Q and A's are fantastic. Um, anyway, enough bang on. Let's get to Alan A W L A N Parker. Uh, his interview here on the regenerative journey. Alan Parker, Charlie. Alan with an A W L A N, not one L and an E. Yep. Do you have to? Do you have to emphasize that sometimes? How many, how often do no, people spell your name wrong? Not very often. Not very often because um, it was a great, it was a family point of contention. Um, my mother always claimed I was ALA and she registered me ALA and, and One she was L. certain about it. But my birth certificate has two. So, so did, did the who put the extra one in there? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it was just you know it was the starting of regeneration. Whatever you do, you add more two. <laughs> You doubled up. You just double up. That's for classic. Yeah. Um, Alan, welcome to the regenerative journey. Thank you. And so welcome to welcome to your um, balcony. To my balcony here in the Tweed yeah. in Tweed yeah. Tweed Heads. We're overlooking um, uh, some wetland, some golf course, some a lot of beautiful native woodland or, or yeah. kind of coastal sort yeah. of stuff. What a lovely spot! It's, it's the golf course here on our right. Yeah, and then the river. Tweed River just in behind the golf course. And it's then a magic spot. Fingal Point and then the ocean. It's amazing. Yeah. I've never, I've never been this little part of the world. Actually, I, I've turned off the highway to go out. We service our car just, you know, behind us a couple of K on that main road. Right. So I was like, oh, I've been here before, but never quite this far into the lovely wilderness that mm. is so close to the coast. Um, Alan, um, talking about being here mm-hmm. and... You did thankfully say it was your happy place. Why? Why is this your happy place? What, what does it sort of do for you oh. when you you sent me a photo the other day of you sitting right here with a little glass of champagne, yes. telling me this is where we're going to sit? <laughs> going, okay, good. Maybe I should have made it an afternoon, an afternoon interview, not yep. a morning interview. Yeah. Um, it's just a beautiful, calming place to be. We 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 had a farm, as you know, on the central coast of mm. New South Wales, and we had a we had a um, an apartment in Sydney where I used as my city hotel and office. And we saw both of those. Um, and as we actually, we went back to Sydney first to the apartment and then after six months we went, can't live in Sydney anymore. It was just too bad. And so we, um, Michael got online and went searching and found this place. How, that's and how many years ago? Four years ago. Was it four? Uh, yeah, four years ago. Yeah. yeah. And he, he, he'd been searching a lot, and every now and again he'd say, yeah, I've got something, and I'd have a look and go, now, not quite. And then this night he showed me this place, and I went, oh, I could live there. And the, we, the were on, views. we were on the plane the next day. Is that right? Yeah. And by the time I turned off the road and realised that we were turning into such a almost secluded private place, and then I struck the golf course, I thought... This is it. Where's the contract? Yeah. Give me a pen. And we actually we actually owned it before we left the building. 
<laughs> There's going to be a story in that because for those who don't know, Alan, he's a master. I know you, said, you mentioned you mentioned the other day you weren't you you don't tend not to use the word negotiator as much anymore. We might we, no. might, we might get to that, but you know, okay. Alan Alan's very good. At, I hate to be a real estate agent selling a property to, <laughs> to Alan because I'm sure he'd be able to get it for nearly nothing. <laughs> Did you use some of your tactics in that in in that? in that half an hour, an hour, um, to, to, to get it over the line? I, I, I used some you, of my, myth, my skills and methods. I wouldn't call them tactics. <laughs> um, reframing is an important <laughs> skill. I, um, when we, we walked in the door and saw the view and just went, we looked at each other and it was almost straight away. And then we went for a walk around and we went downstairs and you know, looked at the the gardens and pool, pool and, yeah. and natural lake and that just, lawn almost looks fake it's so perfect it's, it is it is isn't it it is it's perfect it's just a beautiful cooch and they lawn. take the gardens that are tended to and having had a farm where we had two acres of garden and we worked a lot for it and we used to show the garden it's lovely to be here and have a garden of similar quality and not have to do anything no it just gets done yeah so the the interesting thing was that the the real estate agent actually lived in the building. And I thought straight away that was an insurance policy. Good, yeah, yeah, yeah good call. Yeah. And then after we'd been here a little while, I found out that she was on the body corporate. Even better. And I thought, oh, this is, this is a good combination. And once we'd had a look around and we gave ourselves, we gave each other the nod that this was here. Did you, like, secretly do that so that they yeah, just, weren't going to get excited yeah, and go, just, oh, these people weren't? Yeah, yeah right. And... Um, I said to the woman, may I, it'll sound a bit self-centred, but it's important, um, did you by chance Google me? And she said, yes, as a matter of fact, I did. And I thought it was going to be an interesting morning. <laughs> <laughs> was she on guard? Did and she bring I, some backup? No, no, she was delightfully pleasant. And I said to her, well, look, the one thing you need to know is that the world does, I want it for X dollars and somebody else says why and I teach people not to do that and so what I'm going to do is provide you a transaction figure not a bid yeah. there's no bidding yeah I'll offer you a transaction price at which we will transact today yep okay so that that's and, a figure that doesn't change and you have three options yeah one is hang on I need to make a phone call Yes. Two is yes, and three yeah. is no. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, yep. Are you okay with that? Yeah. And she said that sounds like a pretty good arrangement. Yes. And um, important for you and listeners to notice that in that interaction, I've now got her to agree 15 times. Yeah, right. And we've just got to get better at... at regenerating, if I can use the yeah, word. Yeah, no, totally. We've got to regenerate agreement. And I guess and that you're, you're building to rapport. Generate the connection yeah. and the yeah. rapport. Yeah. And um, so I offered the figure, and she went and and I said we can transact today. And um, she said, "Let me go and make a call," and she did. And so you, you put the figure on the table. On the she table. made the call. She made yep. the call. Yep. She came back with yes. And you. And yeah, so you, you, I transferred a substantial deposit into their account immediately. And did you, you'd done homework to get, to, to, for you to to, yes. to settle on a transaction yes. amount, I, figure, yes. you'd already done that, homework. Quite a bit. Yeah, 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 so you were confident that that, yeah. that was a comfortable yeah. figure to be putting on the yeah. table. Yeah. I remember um, having done some of your courses years ago, Alan, that, that uh, not long after that I, I bought a, uh, an adjoining property and I used your, one of your techniques of the, the three-tiered yes. offer kind of thing. Yes. You know, there's yes. there's three there's three figures, yep. and each one was a little different. One was yes. you know, sort of higher, middle, yes. and lower. Yep. You kind of... You know, I'm, and I'm they're not, all transaction the, figures. The yes. variables are different. Yeah, the, condition, yes. the conditions of the variables yes. or the add-ons or the yep. subtractions are all different. So, was, for example, was, when we sold the farm, um, the farm, farm was really beautiful. Um, we we opened 
the garden to the public about 12 or 13 times, I think. And we, we had a beautiful garden, but what was magical about it, half of it was pots and half of it was in the ground. So, and we had a, an open shed down the back, which we used as a nursery. So we could have flowering garden the whole year round. Yep. So we, we were chosen for the National Garden Show because we had a winter garden that we, I just grow cactus and bromeliads down in the shed. Uh, and in winter, we just, just pop them, dot them all around the place. <laughs> and, <laughs> Cheeky. And they, people come and go, how do you get colour? <laughs> Was and that the I, open garden scheme? The, yes, the open yes, garden scheme? Yeah, 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 awesome. Yeah. yeah. And they, they chose our garden because it was a, a good show in winter. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. And, and it's about, it's about, you know, I'm, I'm just going to sidetrack for a minute, but I'll reconnect it. I, I didn't read until I was 30, and, um, I was an incredibly curious kid. I just had to find out about everything. And I thought the human brain, I was fascinated because I couldn't read and other kids that I went to school with did. Um, and yet I was near the top of the class without it. Sorry, some little funny thing popped up. It's all yeah. good. Yeah. It's all good, yeah, yeah. So, so I, was near, I was near the top of the class and I thought to myself, there's, there's got... I was fascinated by how we thought, for, even from a young, a young age. How we and, as in humans think, yeah, in mind, yeah. Yeah, I, um, you know, I, had, I, had, I was the fourth of nine children in a very working class. My parents were both factory workers. And just, and just, just, just the context of that, where, 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 what, where are we? What state? What town? Um, uh, we were on the central coast of New South Wales until I appeared, and then I was problematic um, with eyes and a couple of other things that were going wrong. And I, um, and my parents had to be taking me backward and forward to Sydney to see what was happening with my eyes. And I, you know, I was only eighteen months, two years old. And I got out and was wandering and exploring underneath the car and somebody went to move the car and I had both legs and an arm broken. That happened? Yeah. yeah. At age two? Uh, under two. Oof. Under two. And at that point, my parents went, they were backward and forward with me to Sydney. And by the time I was about three or four, I think, they decided that it was too hard and they'd moved to Sydney. And so we moved to Sydney. All the family, yeah. the yeah. whole, yeah. yeah. And, and contrary to most people who know me, um, I'm the only introvert out of 11. So I'm a learned extrovert. And, and because, and that fascinated me, and I had both of my parents, they were marvellous people, but they were weekend alcoholics and my father was violent. And, and I, there was part of me that was always fascinated by how can he be such an amazingly wonderful father who talked about he must be polite to women and he get tanked over the weekend and do exactly the opposite. And I think that dichotomy and I was I was not a I was not the sort of kid I decided very early that I wouldn't allow his behaviour to distress me like it did the others. And and it made me very clear that we had more choice about our thinking and our feelings and our behaviour than, than the average seven or eight year old. Um, and I've been fascinated about how we think and feel and I'm very, you know, I wrote Switch On Your Brain in 1983. Switch On Your Brain, I was talking about neuroplasticity. Now, in farming terms, I was talking about regenerative brain function. 
and that the brain had to be able to build on itself and grow and expand and and I was you know as a member of the very sporting family um, I was in a football lap you can see I've got a flat piece in my head here yeah um, I have a metal plate in there. Football injury, from a knee, a knee from a football accident. Oh, football, we're talking soccer, rugby, rugby league, rugby. rugby union. What position did you play? Did you I, was, it was funny. I, I played fullback, but hooker for scrums. So I was back and forward. That's so very, I've always very been, versatile. I'm, I've always no, been... Your feet. I've always been... A bit I've out always there. been out there and agile. <laughs> um... Yeah, I've always been. That's a classic. Agile. That's a, that's but, a. I'm sure anyone, um, any rugby, um, uh, anyone interested in rugby would see the the not the not the humour, maybe the humour, but the the interesting aspect of Alan or anyone being playing hooker and fullback. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. they're often the two in the team that are sort of. The, the specialists, the, the specialists, but also the furthest apart. Yeah, yeah long way apart. You know, in terms of skill and sets. And we everything. we were playing a team that had a guy who was a brilliant kicker, and I, I at, at in school football, I'd played fullback. In age football, because I was smaller, I played hooker, mm. and um, so I played both positions. And this particular team. In the first couple of times we'd played, I hooked um, on the basis we needed to get the ball. But this guy's kicking won the match for them. And um, so the coach put me in as fullback. And that particular guy, um, he broke, and there was only me between them and the scoreline. Um, and I just took a dive at him and um, caught his knee in the forehead. Oof. And uh, spent the next 18, 14 days in a coma. Oh, um, age, age what? 13. Oh, wow. Yeah. Central coma? No, you're in Sydney by Sydney, this time. Western yeah. suburbs of Sydney. And yeah. that was, that was an amazing, I can't imagine, you know, I've often, my mother and father, I heard them talk about it, but I can't imagine what it would be like to be a parent of a 13 year old having a my motionless in intensive care. With knowing that the skull's been fractured and the brain's been hemorrhaged, and you know nothing happening except you know, lying there and with the assistance of being intubated, breathing, I just think it must be the toughest test um, for a, for a parent to have to endure that one. And then, and then, you, then there was a, there was out of the blue one one night, my parents were there and um, my mother said to me, hi Al, is there anything you want? And I said, oh, I'd love a potato scallop. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't imagine, I can't imagine much could have given them more joy. <laughs> was, that, was that one of your things, potato scallop? Yeah. Well, they, they wouldn't have been surprised, that was the first thing no, you said. No, no, no. Like, get him a get potato, him scallop. potato scallop, quickly. Get him quick smile. Yeah. And that was, yeah. that was the beginning of a recovery. Yeah, yeah, and um, I remember, I just, you know, sort of wondering what's 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 happened, mm. and uh, finally they, I got to the stage where they let me out of bed in a wheelchair, and I had to make myself way to the bathroom, and when I got myself up out of the wheelchair, the bathroom, um, I'm bandaged, all the top of my head's bandaged, and my face to the middle of my chest is bruised, and the whites of my eyes were red. And I looked and went, oh, I think something serious might have happened. <laughs> oh, so you were really totally, because you, yeah, you'd have yeah. had no memory of I any of that I had no time. idea what was going on. The last thing, and, yeah. the, and it is interesting that, like, you wouldn't have remembered making the tackle, you would have just maybe have remembered running on at the beginning of the game or maybe the day before, like, I, oh, I guess all that gets I removed. I remembered, I made the tackle, mm. and then there was a scrum formed, and I remember putting my arms around the two props and collapsing. Wow. And at that point, they took me off. Off you went. And, um, thank God you recovered. And, yeah, I'm pleased. <laughs> With your potato scallop. I, I, I'm sure I got my potato scallop. Yeah. So back to... Um, uh, so we, so we've, we've gone Central Coast, Sydney, 
rugby, injury, um, were any skills developing interests? You said you were really curious uh, and family life had kind of informed a curiosity around um, thinking, mind, yeah, we, all those we things. we led two completely different lives. We had a very loving communal Monday to Friday. And then we had this madness on the weekend. And, um, yeah. So, and everybody knew us as the sober people. Um, so, socially, we were, we were a very popular family. Um, even with nine, even with even bringing, nine. bringing nine yeah. kids over. Yeah. So, you, you, you must have yeah. been reasonably well behaved and all those sort of things. The nice, the yeah. nice Parker family. Yeah, um, some of us, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get up to a bit of no good? Um, I was, my mother on my 50th birthday, who said she wasn't going to speak, and of course she did. Mm. Um, Joyce said to the people, Alan is the fourth of my nine children, and he arrived a fully grown and mature adult. <laughs> and I'm delighted to say he's grown into a lovely little boy. <laughs> <laughs> You're um, uh, Benjamin Button. Benjamin Button. Yeah, that was a classic. Yeah. And so um, where was life then taking you at that point? In your teens, um, obviously, oh, I'm assuming, you know, schooling. Yes. Um, was your was your interest or subject matters sort of helping again? Any any sort of signals then that you were looking at, you know, um, you know the obvious leading you to your, your, your vocation, your career? Really, Charlie, I was, you know, as a bit of an average student, um, but the further I went through school, the more I had to read, the, I slipped behind. Um, but the major thing was the Parkers were sporty. You know, we, we, we played sport. And, um, and ending a football career meant I had to find something else. Um, and I tried quite a few things. I, I swam for a while, but it was, I never had any talent at swimming. And, um, and I was a middle-of-the-road runner, but I always loved running. Um, and as we went further through high school and I started to, you know, we got into cross-country, which was three or four kilometres, all of a sudden I started to shine. And it was then that I, I realised that I... I really loved running, yeah. Um, and I didn't, I didn't do running until long, ten years after school, before I really got serious about running. And I w played basketball with a helmet because of, of your injury. Yeah, you I just couldn't. They didn't want me playing contact sport, but yeah. I, I played basketball with a Com helmet. You compromised, yeah. Um, and interestingly, I started with a couple of buddies of mine from school going to the golf course to caddy. And, um, and then there was the, the club was very generous. They used to have a caddy's day. And I had my first game of golf. And within 15 months, I was, uh, no, within a year, I was an assistant golf pro. <laughs> age and what? Age? 17. 17. I was assistant okay. golf pro. And within two years, I was a scratch player. Wow. Yeah. I was, I'm very, I'm very, very disciplined. Mildly, well, no, not mildly, substantially obsessive compulsive by nature. And um, I just practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. And I'd get to the golf course at four or five in the morning hit balls in the dark, um, pick them up and start work, and then do the same after work. And golf for seven days a week. And you were still living at home? Like the, yeah. still, still, was there a point home. at which you went, okay, I want to get out of here? Yeah. Was it before school finished? Because I guess traditionally, I, you know, school I, in an hour. I walked out of school. It was most, I was really, I was is there studious. Else, sorry, um, Alan, just that one there. Is that, that one it there? probably means nothing. Oh, it's probably no, just picking up. No, no, okay, cool. Microsoft wanting to do something. We'll just move Listening that. to us. Yeah, yeah, they know we're, they know we're doing something, <laughs> and they won't accept me saying no. Um, but it won't. It won't. It's still recording. Yeah, yeah cool. recording. Um, yeah, I was a studious kid, um, and I like school, and I like. I've always, you know, learning's just always been 
whatever I've done, that's been one of the central cause. You said you, didn't, you weren't able to read really till 30, so that must have been yes. challenging at school when everyone's nose are in the textbook and you've got, you got, exam, you yeah. got exams or tests and things. And I mean, how the hell did you get through, I, um, through all that? Uh, you've, you've seen me uh, at times. On the, um, I, take, I take 50 yeah. pages of notes a day. Still, you know, 50 years later, um, I'm a, I was a copious note taker. And because I couldn't get it off the book, all of my attention went into hearing. So I, I look back now as a neuroscientist and I think, you know, I was... There's a process in neuroscience called consolidation. And it, consolidation increases your mathematical likelihood of having good memory. And I was consolidating. And I, when, in a morning and afternoon tea break, I, would, I knew who the kids were who discussed what we just had in school and who were the kids who went and played and did something else. And so I used to go straight to them and listen to their conversations. And then we'd recap and summarise stuff. And so the, um, the, the the process of writing as well, hearing, writing, and was, in, was embedding. And I, I, I think 30% of us are conversational learners. And I think we get the talking and listening in our education system is disproportionate. You know, if we were to stop every 15 minutes and go talk to your buddy for a minute, about what we just covered, the the interest, the attention, the retention would escalate substantially. Yeah. And I guess in the school system, you know, we, we're we're homeschooling Lilla at the moment. Um, she was at a Steiner school prior to that. Mm -hmm. Reasonably different style of yes. learning, and, yeah. and one way to quickly explain that, which was fascinating to me when we sort of got her into that schooling system, was. You know, most schools tend to teach you uh, um, uh, what to learn, like this yes. is remember yes. this, you know, whatever. It is. Yes. And then in the style of schools, generally it's about how, how to learn, how how to learn, yeah. you know. And you obviously learning, you were you were create you, you were creating a a framework for learning yourself because you had to. Yeah, I because I was enthusiastic to learn, and I I've always been enthusiastic to learn. I I just worked out other alternative ways. And just so that you know, in a in English classes for instance, and I'm you know, I'm a linguist, so I love language and um, but in English classes I worked out all the teachers who taught us in English right through my school. I could tell you the order in which they got kids to read in the classroom. And I'd always know where to position myself, so I never had to root. Wow! Because the, the, was like so, the that thought was, of standing up yeah. and having to root, having to read, and just so you understand, the eye condition I had it meant I could only see two or three letters at a time in focus, so I could only read syllabically. Um, so I'd go important. And there'd be three bits, and I'd have to put them together. Now my concentration process was used up mm. in the putting together of the syllables. The focus of that. So I could read, and if if I could read out loud and hear it, I'd remember it. But most of the time in class, you've got to read and be silent as you read. And I'd get I'd get no comprehension at all. <laughs> that, at all. That's interesting, though, Alan, because I mean I, I imagine a lot of kids who. Uh, not that that's an excuse, but it's a reason to not learn. It's like, I can't bloody read, yeah. you know, so why I'm just going to cause trouble, not go to school, yes. play up. Yeah. I mean, what was it about? Was it? I guess it was just your nature that you were, you know, you, you became committed to the learning process that you created and you yeah. adapted to. Yeah, and just, I read a lot. Did, did your teachers appreciate that? Uh, appreciate that in, in, a, in a way that, like, this bloke could be really disrupt disruptive, but he's actually... Mm. He's doing. He's coping all right. <clears throat> no, I. But one is none of my teachers ever picked up that I didn't read. Because you were so good at kind of oh, avoiding I, it. I. That's good. good. You could have been a wonderful criminal. Yeah, it's been said before. <laughs> You're not original with that one, Charlie. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. If you were a criminal, yeah. what sort of criminal but would I, you have been? Oh, no, what, if I was an innovator, what, what sort of innovator? <laughs> That's the real question. Innovative um, criminal. Because that, that, you know, that, that really taught me how to be innovative. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I today have a brain that the minute somebody says he's a problem, my brain will go searching for 10 options or alternatives. Never a solution, because I don't think there's ever a solution. That, the world's too dynamic to go solution and describe it statically. Um, and if, you, if you're solving a problem, I have a principle that says 75% of all problems are just symptoms of unmet needs. And if we get caught up in the problem, we often don't get the need attended to. What's the other 25%? Um, <clears throat> neuroses, paranoia, stress. Good call. Because I've been quoting you for the last 15 years. Really? Yep. That one about the, 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 the uh, problems problems are just the consequence of unmet, unmet, unmet needs. needs. That's been my ta- one of my taglines. And, and, but, it is, but, it's, but I'm interested now, I, I must have skipped the 25% yeah. bit, but that is, it, it, sometimes people just see the world as a problem with the neuroses yeah, or, it's, or it's whatever. Their, it's, um, they see the world as a problem, but they see it static. And there's not much that's static. Everything's either dying, to, you know, decaying or regenerating. And expanding and growing, and so in a in a in a, in a discussion or a situation, <clears throat> maybe that's a good time to explore that. You know, with that in mind, yeah. <clears throat> so do you do you kind of assess a situation? And go, ah, uh, this is this is one of those twenty five percenters where it's a neurosis or something, and your approach is different to the seventy five percent of the time where it's actually. And unmet need. Unmet need. You have to like peel everything back, yeah. and then yeah, I guess that's I think, that's asking people questions about what yeah. are the needs that aren't getting yeah. met. Charlie, I, I think the twenty five percent is still unmet need, but it's just a much harder to determine unmet need. Um, you know, if you take me for instance, and I do, you know, I had a very serious obsessive compulsive disorder, and I did a lot of work to to learn to live with it productively, um, but. If you, you know, go back 30 years in Alan Parker's world, half the problems that I encountered was just my expectations of other people that were totally unrealistic. Just completely unrealistic. Um, because your standards, your, because of your obsessive-compulsive disorder, you, you, you were like... You were on point the whole time, and you had like we, everything's got to be hundred percent or thereabouts. Charlie, when I when I was in my functional part, I could see the big system. I could see the interconnections, and um, I could see how the whole thing would come together, no matter what it was. I was good at seeing holistically, um, and then I'd notice that somebody left a tea bag on the sink. And everything would switch off. Just everything would switch off. So that that, that or or somebody somebody <laughs> knocked their glass and spilt water. I just spent fifteen minutes drying everything. Yeah. And you didn't even bat an eyelid when I spilled that water all over so myself and the gear. <laughs> so that so that, that was practice. Yeah. See, I had to learn. I had to learn to create the neurons in my brain. That was calm, cool, and collected and accepting of whatever happened, which were there. They just had never been switched on. Those pathways had to be developed like, like a muscle, I guess, too. Absolutely. So, so uh, that was a question you kind of answered is um, that, that, I guess, became problematic whilst there was a, um, an ability to get stuff done. Because you were good at it, you were, oh. on, you were on it. Like you could, you know, you, you're a pro, you're a pro golfer in yeah. in in a year, and, and probably many other things you just achieved um, because of your 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 drive to, to get it right, for want of a better word. But I guess that can um, can undo you sometimes. Or, or yeah. what, what does that do for relationships or situations when is it eternally frustrating? 
Or was it? Brothers. <laughs> well, maybe for you, it's like, why can't you get it right? Or why can't oh, you do it better? Or not that. leave the tea bag there or whatever, I you know? I did a lot of that. Yeah, I did a lot of that. But at a bigger scale, um, I, you know, I, because I couldn't read and I, 10 years after I left school and played golf and I then ended up going back to school and Kay, my for, late and former wife, um, Kay, used, she was a librarian, a prolific reader, and she was the only person in the world who knew that I couldn't read. She was the only person. She used to read all my notes on the cassettes, and I'd put in my Walkman and I'd go running. And, and listen back to and your... I, I studied running and got interested in and discovered that I could run a long time and got involved in... I ran ultra-marathons before I ran a marathon. Yeah. And you explained, I remember years ago, because I've done, I've, done, I've done your Negotiator's Toolkit course there years ago and seen you most recently at Burua of yes, all places, only a few weeks back. which was we were having a bit of a laugh because the, the, I think the, the next couple, that was on a Wednesday and then on a Thursday you were in Melbourne and on the mm-hmm. Friday you were in Sydney or Brisbane. It's like, well, that's what it is. It's, it's you know, it's it's yes. Brisbane, it's it's yeah. Melbourne, it's Burrawa. Like, yeah. you're on doing the, the major circuits around yeah. Australia. Um, so having had the pleasure of seeing you at RCS, a conference was the first time. Yes. With Terry and crew, I can't remember which location it was. Back. It was a long, long time ago, but it was it was the beginning of, you know, and then uh, Angelica, my wife, and I went to one of your um, workshops in, was it the Intercontinental in Double Bay? Yes. I remember we had such a lovely yes. couple of days. We went, what, are we, what can we do with this bloke? We went over the road and bought you a pink tie. <laughs> <laughs> so you must have been wearing a tie. Maybe it was pink or or, yes. or you'd made some comment about yeah. pink ties and went, right, we're going to get this bloke a pink tie. Um, uh, where was I heading what with a that? Perfect, what a perfect thing to do. Oh, no, well, it, was, it was just such a um, uh, such a wonderful thing. I can't remember what I, where I was going with that, but with that leading question there that went, it went into history. Um, it was about, um, oh, I can't remember. Oh, well, one thing, it wasn't what I was going to ask you, but this has made me think about, the, the, it was fascinating that um, if you might explain the the sort of the le- when when because um, human behaviour and 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 as in human um, what I say behaviour the um, body body movement and and the you know. I'm really yes. conscious of sitting next to you, Alan, too, because <laughs> he's really good at moving his hands and like moving, moving your mind with his hands. It's 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 fantastic. But the left and the right sort of side, when you're looking yes. to the left and when you're looking to the yes. right, you're looking up and looking down. Can yes. you explain that? Because it's one of the sort of really interesting yeah. and and useful yes. things for people it's, to know. It's it, and I'll, it's then I'll get back to deeply, your your life. Deeply fascinating. Oh, that's awesome. Um, essentially, there's. If, if you watch the average person and you're having a conversation with them, you ask them things that they know about, there'll be very little movement in the eye because they know it. Yeah. And you ask them a question, now it pops. You ask them a question and they're not immediately sure of it and they've got to think about it. You'll notice the eye starts moving all over the place. And the less likely they are to know it, the more it moves. And so one of the important things I say to people, if you ask somebody a question and they're moving your eyes, for goodness sake, don't interrupt them because they're going into their brain searching the, the different filing cabinets, see if they can find an answer. And then the, and, and then the left and the and right? The left and the right um, is for 90, 95%, 96% of the population in the world, one side is past and the other side's future. But rather than get into left and right, the simplest thing that people can do with it is if I say something to you and I notice your head tilts to that side and your eye just moves that way, I'm actually going to use that hand when I say whatever I say next. Because that's oh, where you went. That's kind of a... You're, you're sympathising, for want of a better word, with my, I'm, my tendency I'm, to that. I'm, my mirror neurons are actually copying you. But I'm doing it consciously, not unconsciously. But you, but you would not, wouldn't you be at the uh, at a point now where it's just unconscious? You just like your your reaction or your kind of engagement with someone or a group is would be very unconscious yeah. because you're, you're so well versed in that yeah. now. If you if you were to if you were to say, Alan, I've got a problem. You put the problem here, 
And because you put it over here, I'd pick it up and take it over here. So it's a little bit further away from you. For those who can't see us and not watching on the video, yeah, so you're using your hands literally to kind yeah. of... Uh, visually, I see you moving it, yeah. which which kind of does that yeah. like alleviate the problem for me? It's like it you, you're helping take it away from me. The more I move it with your hands from you, yeah, the less you'll feel about it. So if I bring it up here or I put it between us, it's making, me, making me nervous. Allow it's tense. Yeah. yeah, and I can't see if you. We'll have to look it back, but your face just went red and then the dark, dark so extra. Shot of red. Might be the sun too. Yeah. <laughs> it could be the sun. Yeah, the so, sun that's a, so that's interesting. But so that's a, a sign. Proximity that, yeah. is really important. Yep, yep. Um, I'm drinking out of a Jim Lindsay low st- stress stock. Yes, mark. very envious of the, and, its quality there. And in, mm. in the low stress stock handling work with Jim, everything's about angle and proximity and height and tension. Yeah. Now, I. Work, Jim Lindsay often says, you know, it's less stress human handling that I do. I work on the premise that um, I've got to manage the path, and the path is proximity, angle, tension, and height. So, can you say that again? Indeed, proximity, pa- proximity is, is the P, is the distance, yep. A is angle. A, yep. T. T is tension. Yep. And H is height. There was another one too, wasn't there? Yeah, there you, you, is sneak more. It, you sneak it. You sneak it. Is it an F add, or something? I can add extras. What was it? This will test me. Do, okay, get, get the, the basics. Watches, let's get the four first. Yeah. Proximity is if I got there, that's uncomfortable. Whoa. Hideous. No, yeah. not nice. But hideous for me. <laughs> 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 I, don't like, I don't like that. Fair, no, fair enough. Yeah. I understand. Um, and the further apart we move, the less intense it is. Yeah. The, the fact that if you and I both swung our chairs around and we're direct, direct, our pupils will dilate. And that simply says our nervous system's just ready to fight and flight. Yeah. Again, proximity. Again, proximity and the angle. Now, the minute I come to the side here, and if the if people watching notice that throughout this whole interview, I have never looked at the camera. I look at you on the screen or I look at you here. I look at you on the screen or I look at you here. And my eyes are never in the centre of the socket. Yep. And that means if you, if your eyes aren't in the centre of the socket, you can't react. So, so you're kind of softening, for want of a better word, our engagement because you're not you're not putting you're not down the barrel so, and yet yes. there's no confrontation yes. or sort of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah totally. Now, the other thing is, if I want to be credible to the audience, I sit like that. Yes, if your I posture. Want to, if I want to be approachable, I do that. Appro- uh, so you, so you, less, less you, you, you're relaxed and I get relaxed. Less tension, lower the height. Yeah, right. Yeah. So that's, is that all proximity? Oh, it's no, you, you, you've gone through it. Angle. angle. I've, I've found the right distance. Yeah, yeah. I've got the angle. Mm. And uh, what was now, what was again? reduce the tension. Tension. That's yeah. it. And then the H, do we get And the that? H is height. It's height. So I've lowered tension and height. Yeah, right. And as soon as I lower tension and height, I'm actually more approachable in yeah. the eyes of other other people. It's funny, I mean, it, not funny, it, it's, it's so, so stands to reason. Like, I always have, I've never done an interview in, for the podcast virtually, and I probably will, but I really enjoy the rapport, and it's like, this is, you know, in this case, yeah. Alan's happy place, yeah. and, it, you know, it creates a lovely sort of um, uh, forum for conversation. Yeah. And I'm also always done it side by side. Yes. Again, yes. harping back to your, your, your um, what I learned from you many, many years ago about the, the proximity um, and the side by side. And yes. I love that we were, Angie and I were sort of joking about it the other day when I came back from Burua, from, from your Burua thing and went home, you know, 10 k's back home and, and she loves you. And we were talking about, and I said, oh, I remember when you do this. And I was like, sort of, I was like, you know, angling in <laughs> on the side and sort of doing some funny little um, uh, demonstrations again. But it was, but it's really, it's really telling stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Like it really is in terms of rapport. And like, you know, at a, like, a, at a, I mean, large groups of people and meeting people or people you know, it's really, it's interesting. And I'm, I'm probably doing it slightly subconsciously now or unconsciously, which is probably kind of good, but it's that, sidling in 
Hmm. You know, the odd gesture. Now, what remind me of the, the the elbow? Was it the elbow or the or the shoulder? Remind me of that one. Of the the open the open roll, hand roll the rolling forearm. rolling the arm open. Roll the forearm. That's it. That's that. Yeah, and this, that and that's like forearm. that's like transparency. That's, that's that's internationally accepted hand gesture. Yeah. See, we we Westerners, particularly Western males, we do lots of this, lots Cl- of this closed, and it, but it's tense and it's bouncy. Mm. Yeah. And it's harsh. Yep. Whereas, do that. If I offer you that, that's there's no there's no the, aggression. There's no yeah. um, you know aggression there, is there? It's just like yeah. I'm I'm here. I'm open. Yeah. And what about the, the the elbow touch or the or the, oh, or the shoulder you, touch? Uh, I got into trouble the other day. Um, Why? Uh, somebody again? Yeah, again, still <laughs> continuously. I got into trouble the other day for I had a group of sixty people in the room and I had a two human resource people in the room and one of them came up to me and said I just need to point out to you that you're touching people well that was was it for a, was it a closed private and thing I for went, a business and went, yes <laughs> and you touched them <laughs> just had me on the bone with the tip of the finger did they flinch yeah. um, they just did a quick look and I went that's it yeah, yeah. and there was something in that and too because you said there was like a temperature transfer or something if, if I put my palm of my hand mm. on you, you'll find that uncomfortable because you actually now feel heat. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. That's just touch. And it's right on the bone. Yep. Yeah, oh, so that's it. Well, so it's not on flesh. It's not kind of on, on the point. So the elbow. And elbow and, and, the, yeah. and the point of the shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. And you weren't a big fan of the double handshake? Oh, uh, look, it depends. Like, you know, like you, you grab. It, I you, wouldn't do that with somebody. No. But there are some people who do that with I have a, a business colleague and a, more than an acquaintance, but a friend in Sydney, and he's Nepalese. Now, just offer me. A, yep. He he's always doing. He does this ones. and then this. Yep. Every yep. time he shakes hands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's and, nice. And you know, so him. sincere. Yeah, 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 yeah. So sincere. But if you hadn't met someone before. And they were like, oh, violently shaking your hand with two with two hands. Would that be would, a thing? No, it, violently I wouldn't. Be, <laughs> wouldn't be. Well, I have a bit, bit, but, bit more than necessary. But, but um, I, for me, it's if it's natural mm-hmm. and comfortable for the other person. That's that's okay. Yeah, and I, particularly in first greets, um, for the last for, for, sorry for, for the first. last. First greetings. Oh, first greetings, first yeah, time yeah, yeah, yeah. Firm, uh, firm oh, handshake. No. No? No. Oh. It, it is in this instance yes, because it is. yours was. Yes. And mine's exactly the same as yours. Yeah, you're, you're kind yeah. of responding in now, kind. Now, if you were softer, yes. mine would be softer. Yeah, okay. And is that because... Were, if you were much harder, yeah. mine would be much harder. Yeah, you respond in yeah. kind. I guess Absolutely I, match it. And again, it's, that's rapport. So as opposed to like... Of getting deep and deep. Instead of these, like... See, if I get that wrong... Firm, those ones. If I get that wrong... Yeah. Um, we've got chatter going on inside our Well, head. you know, what? the chatter for me is, like, the handshake. I'm, I'm, I was just, I guess, grew up, brought up. Um, firm look him hand, in the eye. Look him in the eye, firm, chest firm out, firm, firm handshake. Yeah. Not not to be in, in in conflict or, you know, competition, but just, you know, greet them in a, in a firm, yeah. you know, measured way. Yeah. And I... Um, Which is fine if the world were only Caucasian Westerners. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. But I we've, got, we've got... We got pretty multicultural in the last few years. So, how does yeah. one navigate? You know, because I can imagine, given the multicultural nature of the world now, yeah. that we would we probably offending people left, right, and centre if we just so, didn't know or all just of went, this, went through. All of this, essentially, or, although, you know, I think part of becoming part of a, a truly multicultural world is to um, throw out the offence. And just simply go, oh, we, we're different. And how might I interact with this person in a way that has to be comfortable? So every time I, I love it when I meet somebody different from a different culture, because I go, oh, this is a chance for me to turn on new neurons that don't work. And I think it's one of the exciting things about the change that's be a, a, upon us permanently just living in the world, you know, things are changing all the time. And the ability for me to, to use your term, respond in time, 
and kind. Um, E.g., my you know I do that with my Nepalese friend. Um, it's not an Alan Parker gesture. Now that one is. Um, I do that. I do that a lot. The hands together. The hands together. Yeah. Um, I love. I I spend quite a lot of time in Thailand. I love the Thai people. And I love the fact that they don't do anything until they honour you. You know, that's, I honour you. That's their greeting? That's their greeting. Yeah. And what about when they finish and up? Like, is that like a, a parting gesture? Yeah, that's cool. Kop kum ka. Yeah. 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 They, um, they, they, they thank you when they leave. Yeah. yeah. Do you, does, does it become, um, because it's, it's, cause it's your, I guess, your profession and it's, it's, your, it's your habit, are there times when you just, Want to switch off and not, and not. I guess if it's, it's if it's subconscious, it may not be something that you're, you're as aware of. But there are times when you just go, I just want to enjoy this and not have to kind of think about them and get my get my handshake the right thing Absolutely. or you know avoid offence yeah. or. See, I'm I'm a learned extrovert. Um, if if I wasn't having so much fun, knowing that I'm growing the neurons in my brain. I want to live a long time and I want to be healthy. I want to have a good mind in older age. And I'm growing the neurons consciously. Yeah. The more we use them, the more they grow. That's the one thing. You know, when I wrote Switch on Your Brain, there was a part of me that couldn't believe that the brain didn't regenerate. And, and when I, you know, when I had the skull fracture, And uh, they were expecting that I'd be brain damaged. And when I woke up and I could start to talk, and they told me that they thought I'd be brain damaged, um, I thought, wow, there must have been a whole lot of repair going on inside there. And I'd, you know, I'd cut myself and bruised myself in the past, and I knew that the body repaired itself. So I, I never, ever thought anything to the contrary that cells can replenish themselves. Um, so given the right condition, the brain can continue to learn and grow and, and develop. And we now know that there's, there's, we now know that there are stem cells in the hippocampus of the brain. So even if we, and, and the, the really thing I, love, I keep saying to everybody, if we get ourselves run around being stressed and rushed and busy regularly, the cortisol that creates the energy to do that kills hippocampal cells. It kills them. And the hippocampus is the thing that decides what goes to long-term memory, what goes to short, and what gets forgotten. And I reckon it's part of my brain I want to look after. So when people go to me, oh, you're, you know, you're, you're a cool dude, you don't... I go, that's calculated. You know, I've worked. On, I've worked a, for this. I was a highly strung, nervous, bedwetting kid until I was thirteen, and 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 I I'm a live, I, I I work at it, being a living example that we can be whatever we want. Yeah. Um, so I had thirty years of believing I couldn't read, and it took a week to go. Oh shit! I can read. How does one become? A uh, learned extrovert. I mean, we've, well, I guess we're talking about it, but yeah. that the very conscious, um, repetitive, disciplined way t to be. Yes. Like so. So let's. I mean, there's lots in that, but in terms of being an extrovert and the definition of, I, I guess we, you know, I would have thought. I I I, I kind of I so get it. But if someone had said, what's Alan Parker? I would have said, you know, extrovert or introvert. I go, extrovert, but it's learned. So, so what was your mission? You went, right, I need to... I, well, why did you want to become Can an extrovert? Can I take it back? Totally. Imagine... This is your show. This, imagine oh. um, nine kids mm. and two parents around a table for breakfast. And some, we all had jobs. So breakfast was always cooked by a collective... And one of the things I got to do regularly was cook the toast. Now, for that number of people, we cooked a loaf of toast, a loaf of bread. And I'd pile the up onto a 
a big platter plate and a go into the middle of the table. Now I was, and still am, the slowest eater and slowest drinker in the world. You'll notice when you came in, you said, do you want a cup of... And I went, you've already got a lukewarm one sitting there. <laughs> From yesterday. Because, <laughs> because I just take small sips. Yeah. And yeah. I eat really... I eat really yeah, we, have, we have had lunch or dinner, Alan. I'll, just, I, I'll keep that in I, mind. I eat really slowly. I'll book a, I'll book a sitting for four <laughs> for hours. Long, yeah, okay. long, long. Cool. And I, I realised fairly soon that because I ate so slowly... The taste was gone before I got get some, and so. And if not very cold. And if I didn't jump in early, I'd I'd miss out. And so that was one of my first recollections of I've got to I've got to step up and put myself out there more. And and they they were an extroverted family, um, you know. They could, ten of them could talk at once. And that was where I learned to listen. I used to go, I, I couldn't bear the thought of talking if somebody was talking. It just, I, I've never liked interrupting. And and the thought that everybody talked over each other, me being obsessive, I had to hear everything. So I couldn't, I couldn't dare talk. And I've got six conversations going on and I'm trying to track them. And now, I, as an international negotiator now, who goes out to morning tea to listen to six conversations at once, I go, wow, that's where I learned that. That's a skill. That's a skill. I didn't arrive with that. It was just as the, the introvert at the table, I didn't want to jump in. I was too busy listening. So what about public speaking? Because you do a lot of it, yeah. and that's not something that introverts are necessarily no. happy to do. That no. that would have been a training... Damn golf. Golf. As a golf pro, you've got to be involved in the golf presentations every competition. Ah, oh, okay. Because you were so good, you were winning. You were, you had to have an acceptance no, oh, speech. No, no, no. We we'd, we'd, well, you would be going... We'd run the welcome. presentation. Yeah, right. Yeah. In front of a crowd. And so I had to... Yeah, I had to... Do that. That was terrifying for the first ten years. <laughs> what about professional speaking? Did you do do, do a course or learn oh, or lots, read or lots, yeah? Lots. Lots. Um, I there's two guys, um, John and Michael Grinder. Um, John's probably John and Noam Chomsky are probably the two most revolutionary people in the world of linguistics. They, what are their names again, sorry? Uh, John Grinder, G-R-I-N-D-E-R, and Noam Chomsky, N-O-A-M, I think it is, C-H-O-M-S-K-E-Y. Um, and I protégéed to John for oh, more than a decade and followed him around the world. And and for... Once I... Once I started getting put in front of groups I I thought this is this is a golden opportunity you can achieve a lot more if you can work with a group of people than if you've got to work individually and and I got over the terrifying body trembling and um, and I I went to a couple of courses and to learn a bit about it and then I got an invitation to attend a course that John Grinder was teaching. And, um, and watching him, I just went, I want to be that good. And then a year or two later, his brother Michael came out. Now, Michael's, I think Michael's the world's leading paralinguist. He, he understands nonverbal communication and learning an amazing level. Um, and I worked and studied with John and Michael over somewhere between 10 and 15 years. And I still work on their principles. And um, when, I, when I want to get a group of people to really take on board something, you know, that's John's 
gifting gesture mm. with Michael's softness. Mm. So I put Good both together. together. And I, I spent, I would pick a person who was renowned for facilitating or speaking or negotiating um, each year and I'd find where they were going in the world and presenting and I'd go and watch them. And I'd, I'd watch some amazing people. Um, one, of the, one of the ones was a wonderful Swiss psychiatrist um, who did the very first really revolution breakthrough work on death and dying. And that was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And I remember I was in the front row of Kubler-Ross and I'm sitting there and everybody talked about how fantastic she was. And she came out on stage uh, rather dowdily dressed, if I may say, hair not particularly well groomed, posture that was a little bit... And I thought, oh, this is disappointing. And she sat on a stool in the centre of the stage, like this, and in the softest... You know, it was microphone, but it was beautifully soft voice that you couldn't but go... Oh, how comforting. And I sat there watching, and she had the entire room mesmerised within about 30 seconds. And I thought, this is magic at an invisible level. i, I just got to watch what this woman's doing. Because she knew and, exactly what she was doing. I don't know. No. No idea. Her dress? Was that just the... I thought you were going to say that she, she was, like, demonstrating and then she came out with, like, a power suit just, and then... No, no. The, it was a floral just, dress yeah. and the colour of the shoes and the dress didn't match. And for an obsessive compulsive, that's pretty important. <laughs> yeah. um, but she had, she had an inflection in her voice hmm. that you couldn't but pay attention. And you couldn't but... You couldn't do anything else in her presence but feel safe. Listen. And, and really absorb. Yeah. So what was actually and taking you to the stage where you were, you were needing, apart from golf presentation days, where you were putting yourself in a situation where you had to be on stage and you, were, and you felt like you needed to upskill your, your public speaking? I wanted speaking. to be good at it. But, I, but, but, but doing what, though? Like what, 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 I what? don't care. Okay. Get a group of people and let's see if we can give a group of people a better experience than what they can have on their own. So it wasn't because you had chosen a career and you're going, right, I need to be able to talk on stage. It was just like, I like the idea of being able to do it. Charlie, I, I am the least goal-setting person that you know. <laughs> the world has gifted me things and put me in places and connected me with people, whether it's God or the universe or fate, I don't know. But I never have time to set a goal. Something turns up and goes, Alan, he's a... You know, I, I left golf, went back to school and started studying naturopathy. And I was a second-year naturopathic student and the principal of the school... Of the, of, it was called Health Skills International. It was... I was offered the job of director of studies at the college as a second-year student. So I'm still, I'm still studying and I'm running seven colleges around the country and I did not have a clue what was going on. Not a clue. But it was, you know, I, I have a... Why, why, I'm why? An ins, I mean, I'm, I'm essentially a discoverer and an, an, an experimenter and I just went, I'll give this a shot and see how I go. And it was a discovery. And but what, of, all th of, of all things, though, what was, what was why naturopathy? Well, I... At age what? what are we, where are we sort of up to there? I and, started studying naturopathy halfway through my time as a golf pro at Juma Golf Club, so let me think. Um, I'd have started studying naturopathy at about 26. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah, it's 30, because my, my qualification has um, 1982 on it. Um, and I studied it externally, and came 
produces produce cassettes, and then um, and then we went to Europe for a year, and partly for both of us wanted to do some study in different parts of Britain and Europe, and um, I studied with a backpack on, and I continued sending my work back um, to Australia, and. Um, I got about, yeah, you know, I, I, I was director of studies for about six months and I had to stand in for a lecturer to teach humanistic psychology and I'd done no study at all. Um, but I got Kay to read me the notes and put them in a cassette and I went running and gave myself a few days to learn what was in the subject I was going to teach and I taught my first course. In not, psychology, not, not the first course, but not one, not just one lesson. It was a whole, it was a one course, lesson, one, one lesson. lesson. Okay, yeah, yeah. I was standing just for one lesson. Yeah, right. And I thought, well, this is interesting stuff. Mm. And within two months, I'd enrolled in a graduate degree in psychology, and um, and I was really convinced that people got sick because of what they thought and felt. Um, and that we had infinitely more choice and control over it. That we, uh, naturopathy taught me I don't have to wait to get sick to take care of my health. And I think we have a world that thinks you've got to be sick before you're worthy of health care. And, and that, Charlie, was a turning thought process for me. Because I went... This life is not about remediating, it's about creating. Yeah. And I went, I haven't got to fix getting sick, I've just got to get... And because I was getting, and I was running it, I was getting super fit. Um, and my energy level went up, I could... You know, I was just zooming along and life was pretty extraordinary. Um, and, you know, I was one of the very pe early people in Australia running aerobic classes. And did, you have all the, did you have all the gear? Seven, oh, all the gear. Yeah. Well, not really, but sort of the gear for 1990. Which is um, pretty... 70, well, Kay and I were married in 75, and we were running aerobic classes by 77. That must have been pretty early yeah. on in the aerobics it's world. very early in the aerobics So was, it was one of your... Sydney, gym in Sydney City was one of the few places you could go to an aerobic class. Who was that American aerobics dude? Someone Simmons, not Gene Simmons. Um, yeah. He was like, I remember mum used to watch him on TV, and he was like Mr. Aerobics, big right. fuzzy hair, mm -hmm. sort of small guy, but he was like Mr. Aerobics. It was mm -hmm. a and the gear was mm -hmm. sensational. Yeah, when, well, there was an explosion of aerobic gear yeah. in the 80s. Was there a point? So you were sort of oh, busted my pen. You were launching into, um, I guess, psychology. Yeah. Was there a point at which you kind of looked back at your life and went, "Ah, oh, okay, I'm. I've actually had a really interesting life and had challenges and had experiences that have that are going to stand me in good stead." Uh, for 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 uh, for a career, and you may not have actually. You know, said I'm going to have a career in psychology. Charlie, I still don't know what I'm going to do. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're a little boy, remember? Oh, That's what Mum said. Oh boy. That's right. I, um, you know, I, I was a professional golfer. Then I was a student. Then I was director of studies at a naturopathic college and a student. Um, and and then I I started getting invited. Well, t big turning point. Uh, I. I met Dr. Denison at San Diego University. Within a week, he doubled my reading speed. And and I just wanted to follow him around the world. Um, but I didn't, I came back because I'd also enrolled in a graduate degree in adult education at UTS. And um, I came back and I was so charged up with what Dr. Denison had done with right and left brain integration work that I thought and I I had enough naturopathy and enough psych to go, I'm gonna write a book that's got all three of those things in it. And um, and I wrote Switch on Your Brain and I, I dictaphoned I used to dictaphone. I dictaphoned it in a weekend. 
and then got somebody to edit it and we we had it published in inside a month. So that was a combination and, of neuropathy. And that was a massive bestseller. Yeah. yeah. And in fact Ida Buttrose um, interviewed me at least twice on two UE a long, long time ago. And um, that made me a, a national figure. I was on, I was on in a, over a hundred radio programs in a, in a year. I, I was on the breakfast show at least a dozen times in the next year. And all of a sudden, I've gone from being this clinician, because I'd, fin- I'd finished at the college, I'd become a full-time practitioner, both in naturopathy and in and in sort of pseudo counselling. I never. I decided once I did. I did. I studied personality disorder and psychopathology diagnosis, and decided psych's too hard. I don't want to do that. Um, but I combined some counselling with the naturopathy. But once, once the book came out, we were just inundated. We rented an office and put four phone lines in it with answer machines on it, and it was the only way we could keep up with the calls that came in from the Itabatros interviews. And I started running seminars to teach parents. And a parent, had, a parent could only come if they bought it, a child, and a child had to bring a parent. And I'd teach the parent how to do the work that I'd do with their children if they came in. And I ran a weekend workshop on that. Gosh, I reckon it was three weekends a month for four, three or four years. Wow. And the second workshop I ran, I had a guy from IBM um, bring his two children, and they had really good breakthroughs on the weekend. He rang me the following day, on the Monday, and said, "What I." He said, I was fascinated by what you did with the kids on the weekend. And I was thinking I need my executive group to to do that. And that was my first opening into the corporate world. And somebody from that group moved to Apple and somebody from that group moved to Novell. And all of a sudden, I'm, and I worked with Microsoft in Australia when they had five employees. Okay. And I still know two of them. Yeah. Did... That's an interesting combination, and now I understand how you got to have that combination, but I guess psychology and naturopathy, that's not very, that's not a very common oh, kind of thing, would it, would it be? I think you'd find it would be. Would it be, really? Yeah, so yeah. where had the naturopathy kind yeah. of, in those, how did you combine, what, what part of your courses or your teachings w- was, did, did it take up the naturopathy kind of part of it? How, in my practice? Yeah, like, well, your practice, but well, more so in your teachings, your, your presentations, because I kind of oh, get, like, yeah, how, where, where was that coming in? Yin and yang, there's no black and white, there's curved lines, not mm. straight lines. Mm. Um, You know, Chinese medicine, naturopathy, is about um, liberating and regenerating the cells in the body to improve good health. Um, It's not about waiting until something's wrong and try and fix it. And um, and everything I've done is about creating improvement. You know, when I taught golf, taught people to play golf. It was about improvement. Um, And improvement is just about applying learning. And so my fascination for learning and, and understanding the pleasure that comes and the brain, I now understand what brain chemicals are initiated, but you know, Learning actually produces euphoria. Tell me, uh, I'm just conscious of time, Alan. It's um, we're kicking along. Um, And then your career just well, not well, and probably did explode. So corporate in the corporate world. You mentioned, I know that you you did some work with the UN. I mean, and I guess. Where I guess did that your career and your 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 I guess own education, educating others, it sort of then 
you were known or still are known as a negotiation yes. expert. Where yeah. did that sort of come into it? Did you sort of go, oh, everyone's fighting, I need to help them out? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, what, what, what yeah. were some of those experiences? Where did um, that happen? I, Do you remember a particular was, conflict? There's, there's a very, very important turning point. I was delivering a lecture at University of Technology and I was lecturing on the impact of personality in conflict and how to manage personality, manage conflict through managing personality and managing personality through conflict. And there was a man in the audience, beautifully dressed, an immaculate grey suit and the most beautiful yellow tie and white shirt that looked like it would come straight out of the dry cleaner. And handsome, big guy. And um, Copia just wrote notes the whole time. But beautiful carriage and posture. And he asked one question. He had a very slow, deliberate voice, Eastern European accent. And um, I thought, wow, what an exquisite question. And uh, a few days later, I got a message from this man saying, I was in your class, would you have coffee with me? And his name was Peter Fritz. And Peter's an extraordinary innovative businessman and I think he'll be okay for me to say and philanthropist and um, we had wonderful conversations and then he started asking me if I'd do a few projects with him and it was it was in the early before the dot com era and he said to me, I've been asked by the Commonwealth Government to organise an event um, in Sydney called the Virtual Opportunity Congress. And they've asked me to come up, find the, the best hundred minds in the country to talk about how do we deal with this internet and is there a need for it to be regulated? So and this is like mid nineties, is it? Maybe. Oh, earlier. Earlier, yeah. I think it was earlier. Is that one of your mates? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Little. What is little, that little butcher bird? Little thing? butcher bird. Cute. Yeah. Um, and he invited me as one of his guests to that, and I was it was in Parliament House in Melbourne, and I'm sitting next to Edward de Bono. And I thought. Is it wrong? This is, this is pretty cool. And then the next, wasn't long after that, that he said to me, um, I'm doing a project with the OECD in Paris. And um, I, I wonder, I've got the Director General of whatever it was, the Turkish ambassador to the OECD. Um, could you have a coffee with us and I went and had a coffee with them and by the end of the meeting they'd invited me to sit on the what's called the high level consultative committee for the Bologna process at the OECD Wow! and um, the next year I was in Paris 12 times attending as part of that as committee. part of that yeah. um, and 2004 that project ran for five years. 2004, we had 1,200 world leaders in a venue in Istanbul and they ratified 16 global policies for small to medium enterprise for planet Earth. And that was what the Bologna process was. So that would have been taking and a bit of negotiation. I, I was, uh, they, they tagged me the expert advisor on agreement. I think it's the best title I've ever had. <laughs> and what was what what did what did you bring to the party? What what did they see in you, or what did you present, or what I, what, what, I, what 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 were some of those little I things? I think that... if Peter Fritz was here, he'd say, um, "Professor Parker brings questions that sit in the rest of our unconscious minds, and he asks them at exactly the right time." Yeah. And I, I did nothing for five years, really except sit in large meetings with large groups of people and ask 
agreement-oriented Christians, not argument and debate, not 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 leading Christians, not not setting somebody up to get them where I wanted them to get, but genuinely asking questions about what people's deep motives were. Yeah. And the deeper you go on asking people about their motives, the more you find in common. Because I guess that just it 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 um uh, it um, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess it just removes I guess it removes, comp- removes conflict. And there, I guess there there there's all the yeses, yes yes yes. Oh mm. shit, actually we have got a bit in common. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So that's one of the tactics. And or that, the so there was that, and um, <clears throat> then he did another project with the European Union through the as a um, as a it was Australia supporting two Eastern European countries to ascend to the into the European Union. And I was visiting professor at the Technical University of Budapest for two years and I I didn't live there. I travelled backward and forward to Budapest every six or eight weeks for a couple of years. And um I just helped them. I taught them how to negotiate and present and facilitate meetings. One of the one of the interesting things I remember again from years ago was you you highlighted the fact that um, and I, we, this was a, I'll sort of get to the the farming context of that. But it was with a RCS and it was in a group of farmers. Yeah. And one of the things you said was you know highlighted was that we have to negotiate and sometimes the hardest negotiations we have to have are with ourselves uh, well I I frequently say to people there's a mate of mine called Charlie Arnott and he talks about the importance of the paddock between your ears and I use that once a week and I say to people your external negotiations are only as good as your internals that if I'm stressed inside my head, then the frontal lobe of my brain won't work well and therefore I won't handle the complexity that's there. Mm. And if I get... if I Well, it's hard to do here on the, in this format, but if I can get a group of people to switch off their internal chatter, magic happens. Absolute magic. How do you do that? Oh, that's the next course, Chuck. That's the next <laughs> course. Are you putting that together? <laughs> I'm, I teach it already. But I, I, because I'm, you know, I'm a negotiator who's a behavioural scientist and a neuroscientist and forensic linguist, um, my work for the last decade, <clears throat> particularly as a scientist, is working out what micro behaviours and what learning, what speech patterns produce what movement in the brain, what activity in the brain. And if um, just the, the people watching will realise that, you know, if I do use my hands, they're always to the side. And if I do, I direct it that way and I'm directing your eye because it'll follow the hand. Now, if I can get your eye moving, I get different parts of your brain working. The eye still is the same part of the brain. It's why people can't concentrate for long. It's why people fall asleep when they're not watching presentations, because the eye doesn't move. Yeah. But the one thing I do constantly is make sure the eye's moving. And you move, yeah. and I guess on the stage you you, you kind of move around, so a they've lot. got to follow you, and, and yeah. that in itself, your gestures on the stage and your speed or your... I think you were, they said, you know, if you want to <laughs> say something... Um, poignant, you stop. Yes. Is that right? Because a stage, and you kind of like <laughs> so everyone's like pulling around, then and saying, "Whoa, he's just stopped." So I do, I do a lot of movement. It's all mm. choreographed and very calculated. <laughs> yeah. It's not. It's not. Is that? Is that? Is it, did your aerobics help you um, in that choreograph? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> without the, without the, without so. the, yeah, the, um, so. the, what are they called? Yeah. The leg warmers. Yeah. No, I never, I never <laughs> used leg warmers. I never wanted to know what leg warmers. Um, but it's it's about choreographing, and so I'm very dynamic and in the move a lot. And so if I want to make a jolly, this is critical, and we've got to get this point, every one of us. And 
not just get it, but get it and do it. So when oh, you, 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 you had my attention. So I, I do the opposite to what I normally do to make a, a really strong point. Mm. Yeah. Now I'll just I'll just do it toward the camera, mm. but not at not at the camera. <clears throat> I said, "Where's that microphone?" Yep. Yeah, um, if I were to want to capture your attention. I, I, I'd bring you in toward me, and then I'd go. I'm just, I'm just wondering. Is is there a number of different ways we might be able to do this? Now, as I move that hand, the eye goes, and every time I move that hand, a different part of the brain's processing. So if they didn't come up with an option there, they might there or they might there. And for and those who can't see, Alan's kind of you just want to explain what you. But, but, but for the audio, for the well, oh, for, for the audio, for people who don't you. actually see the Excellent. video, thank you. No, just just yeah. explain that you were just sort of um, like. Um, uh, I'm moving my hand. Yeah. I put my hands in the centre and draw my hands toward me, mm. so it feels like I'm pulling you in. And then I just move the hands across to the side, very gradually, smoothly, but almost a soft bounce and if I go there's probably one, two or three options here or more and I could then go or more and each gesture will trigger a different part of the brain working and as long as I do difference the brain remembers difference and that, that the, more, the more same I am um the less likely the brain will remember. Which is a bit like yeah. the same if you're standing in the room, the presentation not moving, their eyes aren't moving, that's the same, they're bored. They'll all go to sleep. So you're making it much more palatable and you're kind of, I guess, removing defensiveness yeah. or kind of you're, you're, hot, you're, you're um, encouraging openness in that, aren't you? <clears throat> John Grinder, when, in the early days when I was working with him, John used to use the term... You're out there to dance with the audience. Yeah. You're, you're not there making gestures, you're there transporting the audience with you. And the, he said the term having them in your hands is never true. It's having them with you mm. as you're doing what you're doing. And not talking at them or even to them, but with them. Yeah. So that leads me to negotiation. Any t- any tips? Well, oh, let's do the like a reprimand because that's a, that's a, that's a oh, very. Charlie, that's just, a, just give me one second. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind. No, no. no. Not. We, we can't do that. We can't use the word we, reprimand. We no. can't do that. We. It's not acceptable. Now I'm not sure if you're. you're, 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 you're <laughs> it's not funny, Charlie. Which one? Which bit? Not, Sorry, I'm not sure if you're you're demonstrating not, something. It's not acceptable. Okay, I'm very serious. So we can't do that, right? Yeah. Oh, that. <laughs> so I'm going to touch your bone you there. Go right ahead. <laughs> you go right ahead. Okay, you had my attention. Just, just yeah, yeah. That's how you. It's indirect. Remember, yeah. I've, I've increased the distance <laughs> to reduce the intensity. Such a magician. I've angled my body. I've got the eye out of the centre of the yeah, socket. Yeah. I've melted my body yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. spoke softly. Yep. Yeah. And before I said anything, I just nodded my head to go. Mm. You, can't, my, I'm just shaking my head, going, "No," but I didn't even say it. So what? I'm what's sorry, Charlie? So, so that's that's that's, that's, that's not, not 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 right. Not acceptable. But how do we get to we that point? We can't do that. How do we get to that point? So say you say. Don't, you don't mean to think about it. <laughs> We Mom. just need to be really clear, Charlie. And it's off. That can't happen. But I need and to know it, how you... it needs to never happen. <laughs> you're, making me, you're making me... I'm very clear. clear. I'll do anything Excellent. at this stage. Thanks. But just let's put that into the context of... A, say Because I love the fact that you... Um, soft. Soft. See, it's, it's hard words. Yeah. But soft delivered, everything else. Delivered yeah. softly. No, Charlie. That can't happen. Can't happen. 
So in, now, in, if I do nature, Charlie, that can't happen. Yeah, that's, go hard, that's hard. aggressive. It's never going to get up. So you you do a lot of work with farmers, and, yes. and the, the, my experience of you was via mm. RCS. I mm. love the fact that you're in the farming world, and 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 I've um, spoken to Terry twice in the last two days. Is that right? Uh-huh. He's a lovely. I had a lovely to when when the hear the mower there. Yeah. It reminded me when I got golf here course. of yeah the golf course. Well, I, when I did my interview three hour marathon with 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 Terry in the botanic gardens of Brisbane, mm-hmm. we had didn't have one mower. We had about sixteen yes. and tractors and for and all around the botanic gardens. gardens. But we we got through it. Yeah. So you're working a lot with farmers and say, yeah. no, um, I'm just going to pose a sort of a little scenario for you, which is going to be really mm-hmm. helpful. I'm not saying this happens at mm-hmm. home, and I I need to. This is a this is yeah. a, I mean it kind of does in any work situation, but just say. Um, I've had, and there's lots of variables I know, and this is I'm just trying to make it a simple one. I've, yeah. I've, I've asked someone to do, put those sheep from that paddock into that paddock via that gate, uh-huh. and they've gone, yep, no worries, I'll do that. Yeah. You know, and I know it's that gate because it works best. Years of moving yeah. through has told me that's the best way yeah. to do it. And then the, that afternoon, so how'd you go with those sheep? And they go, yeah. Got it sorted. Got it sorted. It's all sorted. And I went, oh, cool. I drove past the paddock and I noticed they weren't in that paddock. Or, and they said, look, I, I just took them through the other gate because it was there. And I thought, oh, look, I'll just do it. Let's just say, use that as an example. Yes. So, and then, and I go, oh, like, what do I do at that point? Because I'm, I, I needed them to go through that gate yes. for very good reasons, yep. and you know, yep. whatever. And then they've, then they've, dare I say, ignored me. Yep. yep. And Brock, if you're listening to this, this is not at you. This is, this is <laughs> at all. This is, this is, this Who's is a, no, this is a lifelong thing. This is a. Li- I'm just using a farming context yeah. for it, but it yep. could be, you know, domestic yep. situation. Yep. So yep. tell me, how do you, how do we navigate great that? Great buddy who I used to work with a lot in large complex. Disputes. A guy named David Brody, and Brody used to say, "Alan, we just got to remember that conflict never occurs in a vacuum." And the first thing is, how many times have you done that with the person? Would be my first question. Arsac. Uh, um, Arsac. Was that the first time it's ever happened, or has it happened six times? Or um, let's. It's different. Yeah. It's okay. Different. Let's just say. Um, it's happened before. So there's a, there's a bit of a, bit of a recurring bit of a, pattern. Because we've got to go, we've got to constantly go, am I dealing with a one-off event or am yeah. I dealing with a pattern? Okay, Because sure. pattern detection is critical. Yeah, okay. Now, so if it's happened six times in the last three months, yep. I'm going to go, Charlie, you've got to take at least 50% responsibility for it. Is this what you're yeah. actually saying yeah. to the... To the yeah, yeah, I'm saying to you. Yeah. Oh, hang no, on, so which role are we playing? You're, oh. you're, you've just given the person the instruction. Yep, so maybe I didn't do it, it properly. You've, or maybe, maybe I wasn't rather clear. Rather than not properly, maybe you didn't do it the way they needed it instructed. Delivered. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, E.g., if I say to you, um, I want you to take them and put them in that paddock and take it through that gate, and I keep eye contact with you and point at them, yep. um, I've got a lesser chance... Than getting it, mate. If I go, mate, over there. See oh, that? okay. I'm point, that's, you're, you're that's pointing me at want, it. Yeah. That's, okay. That's visuals. That's where I want to end up. Yeah. And the easiest way, quickest, simplest, is through that gate. Yes. Over there. Yep. Yeah. And that could be on a map too. Of course. Yeah. The same sort of be, thing. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm looking at a map. Yep. But if you can direct the eye to where you want to go, okay, you've got a much better chance. Yes. Simple as that. And, and, then, that em- and that emphasises the importance of it? Because then, someone might just go, oh, this bloke. Then I, I might see if it's somebody has been working with me for a while um, and they're not actually following the instruction because they think there's a better way. Yes. Yeah? Yep. I might go, hey, I want to move the cows or the sheep. Um, where, where do you think is the next place we move them? So, sorry, are you asking yeah. me as the... Yeah, I'd, if I were you, yes. I'd say to the employee, uh, where, where would you move them next? Is this before or after they didn't do it the way I'd want well, it before? Prefer- I'm asking for the... Preferably before. Yeah, so I'm kind of engaging but, them for a bit of ownership of it. You've had it happen, yeah. and the next time you might ask them, what's yeah. your thinking about? Yes. Where they need to Where go. Where do you think they should yeah. go that way? Okay, so get it, you get a bit of... And if they go, uh, come up with a hairbrain one, go, tell me about your thinking. Mm. Yeah. 
what other options did you think about? Mm. And um, what would what would happen if we did that? And um, give me another example of, or another thought about where it could be. And you're actually then teaching them to think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, good leadership is about reducing the need for instruction. Good negotiation is um, is uh, good negotiation is about skillful listening and questioning. Really. And what if they? So what if we've of, of my delivery? If we're going to count for my delivery being pretty good, it was bad. Yeah. No. In terms just didn't of quite work. No, but yeah. but in terms of, let's just say that the scenario is the the map's been shown and the and the and the even the pointed fin out through yes. the gauge. Yeah. There's been a, a head nod and a yep, yeah. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'm gonna kick it off in an yeah. hour and that person's gone out. Yeah. And I've just gone, Right. In my yeah. mind I've gone, job is as good as done. Yeah. There was agreement, and, there was a head nod, there was acknowledgement. <laughs> and then three hours later it's like they're in the wrong paddock or yeah. whatever. There's there's yeah. the, the the, the agreed activity has not been carried out yeah. in the agreed way. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I come back and I notice it and yeah. I go, well, how, how do I approach that? Do, do I say, you know how he said just three hours ago you were, we agreed you were going to yes. do that? Yeah. That didn't actually happen. Yeah. Is that what, you, is that, is that what one do. would say? Yeah. yeah. Well, what would you do? What would you suggest? Oh, it could be a variety of ways. It could be... Um Hey mate, I noticed you didn't quite get it where I wanted it. Yeah. I wonder if you could shift them from there to there. Oh, I just had, I, I just had, I, I just thought it'd be better to go through that gate. Yeah, yeah, I, I get that, I get that, but it didn't quite, it didn't quite get them where we wanted them to be. So can I? Get oh well, they did. They kind of got, they were, they got in the same paddock, but it was like the other end. I just, yeah, it was quicker. Yeah, I, you know. Yeah, it was, it was quicker. But it hasn't quite done what we needed it to do. So can I get you to shoot over and just shift them again? And then when you've done that, just pop back on and have a quick word. So and I've yeah, yeah, walked out and gone, oh, get bloody it, hell. Get it fixed. Yeah, okay, so yeah. that's the first thing. To get. What yeah. if it's not fixable? What if, it's, what if it kind of, the job got done, not in the way that was I, right. I suggested. <laughs> now I'm going to reprimand you. Okay. And go, me. I gave you uh, an instruction with a clear yeah. one and there and that gate, and that didn't happen. And I know that you had some thoughts about it otherwise. However, I need you to know that there are sometimes I want you to think and make a decision, and sometimes not. Yeah. And on this occasion, I was pretty clear about what I wanted. So, can we have a an agreement that if I go, this is how I want it, that's what you'll do. And on occasions when it's not that important and there's a choice around it, I say to you, where do you reckon? How would that be? That would make it easier for both of us, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. So you sort of almost de- de- you demarcate the... Um, it's helping define, I guess the degree of flexibility there might yeah. be for them to con- yeah. sort of consider. Because yeah. there's also an occasion, not dissimilar, where you might say, um, can you do some research on that? Because once the research is done, that means we can go and buy something, right? Yes. And we need to, you know, the research needs to be done by tomorrow and we're not going to buy it on Friday. Yeah. And then I've and I've gone in my mind that's that that is now delegated to that person. Yeah. I don't have to keep thinking about that, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then it's Monday, yeah, and I I'm say the person you're asking to do that, given yeah. I'm a researcher. Yes, let me just jump in. Yeah, and yeah. Go, Charlie, um, give me the three things you want me to focus on the research on. Oh, what are the three things you need to know? I need to know price. Yeah. I need to know availability. Yeah. And I need to know um, color. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's got to be red. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, good. Yep. So so I might my, my And so it's within two weeks time frame. No, we need I need to know so I can make the decision. I'd like you to get that research back to me tomorrow. Right. Please. Right. And I you know, do you agree that's a realistic time so that's, frame? That's pretty quick. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. No, it's pretty urgent. And you're okay if I do what I, and get it to you this afternoon as best I can. Um 
if you can't, I'd I'd love it by nine a.m. tomorrow. Right. Okay. If you can't get it to your nine a.m., can you just tell me? Where yes, yeah, definitely. Because yeah. I'd I'd rather get it to you this afternoon. Okay, that'd be that'd be even better. Yeah. And well, I'd like to buy it. I need to ring that agent by five p.m. tomorrow, right. and then make that purchase. So Don't it's, tell me so that. It's, so it's I've, here on Monday. I'm going to work toward getting it tonight. You've just opened up a new time frame. But I need to. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I Don't need tell, to know it so I can then. That. I want it by nine in the morning. Okay. You've just opened up the possibility that I've got more time. Well, I need it from you by nine, yeah, so I can then make a decision by five. Matter. Okay. Right. Too much information. You need, you need, you're negotiating with me on, on yeah. the piece we're doing. Yeah. Don't add the extra bit. And so, say we've had that discussion. It's Monday morning. No, hang on. That doesn't work because I would have known by Friday. Oh, here we go. Sorry, can I quickly change it? They've got to buy it by 5 o'clock on the Friday. So it's like, can you do the research? You tell me. I'll give you approval. And then you go and buy it. You you, you make the call. No, you go on the Friday, right? So there's a time frame for purchase, but I'm not making that final call. I've just said, that's the decision we're going to make. We got a red one. They're available. I'm happy with the quote. Give them a call by Friday. Close the business Friday, and we'll, we'll make that because it's got to be here Monday. Right. I get to Monday, and I go, "How'd you go with that oh, purchase? Is it going to turn? Is it, it going to be here it. today?" And you they go, go "Oh, no, no, I'm going to stop you, stop you, stop you. It's a dreadful case study. <laughs> dreadful case study. And you, is it? And you, yeah. And I keep giving you, I keep giving you replies to your questions, and then you go, "Yeah, but what about?" <laughs> and you just keep adding. And I go, "No, I'm trying to make it a, a, a like a, a not uncommon kind of." When there are other people involved, like um, where that, that one, there's a delegation, that one, that, that's the last two examples. Yeah, your delegation has been suboptimal. Okay, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep, yep. Now, if you want me to do it and get it to you by five this afternoon, yeah. you and I are going to check in at four thirty. Yeah. yeah, and we're not going to leave Friday afternoon and find we haven't got it on Monday. But do I have to? Ch- Oh, no, we, yeah, we, okay. The word was we are going to check in. Yep. So I either go, you're doing the research for me, I want you to contact me at 4.30 and let me know where it is. Yeah, okay. So I delegate the responsibility of the follow-up to you. Or if you've got a pattern of not getting it, I'm going to check in on you at 4 o'clock. Yep. Because I am not going to let myself have a weekend thinking I've got something on Monday without me knowing I've got it. What if it's a total delegation of of a job? It's like you do the research, you choose a colour, and the, and you you okay it. So I'm do, totally delegating it, but we need it by Monday. It's got to be here delivered Monday, right? And they go, yeah, I'll do it. It's all fine. Yeah. And Monday comes round. And the bit of gear I, turns up that's not what I asked for. It's like totally different. It's like oh, and and the, and, the, and they go well. Same pattern. Well, the, the, what if they say? Well, I actually thought same this pattern. would be better. You've already done that scenario. Yeah, I guess so. Pattern. Yeah. The same so, pattern. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah. See, the examples are slightly different, but it's all the same pattern. Yeah. yeah. The two of you haven't been tight enough. With the specs. With the follow-up. Mm. So you're clear with the instruction. Yep, no, you're right. There's no, there's no checking in. There's no follow-up. There's no feedback I system. guess there's accountability, isn't it? Yeah. For the parts of and, the... And, you know, if I'm going to give you a task, um, I, I'm going to delegate to you to update me. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Have a look at my mobile phone. You know, time and frame. And the messages that between me and Jen, my EA. Mm-hmm. We have 30 messages. A day. At, at least. An hour. At least. <laughs> at least. Yeah. yeah. And she'll she'll send me a message. She, if if she's said she'll do something by 1 o'clock today mm. and it's looking tight, she'll send me a message, go, I'm close, but I'm looking like it's going to be hard to get there. Yeah, right. What, so what you're, never dis- you're never disappointed because we I guess never. you never know. Mm. We never not deliver on time. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's a discipline too, we isn't just, it? Itself? Because we just keep checking with each other. Communication. Time. Yep. Um, Jen sends me a message. That's done. You know, the the airplane's booked. Yep. The motel's yep. booked. The hire yep. car's booked. You're never there sitting. When have you got that? I always go, 
thanks. Yeah, acknowledge. Never not think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I go to Jen, just checking in on, and she'll just go, done. Yep. Yeah. Yep. When you're as obsessive as me, you got you've, got, you've got to have feedback. Yeah. Um, and we do not do enough feedback and checking. And we, we do this illusion that if I say, Charlie, do something, that you'll do it exactly the way I want it. Mm. And we're often not clear enough about the detail. About the detail. No, fair. See, I don't think I'll... As a researcher, the minute you go research something, I go, oh, what? what? <laughs> yeah. you know, just give me a little bit of an indication of what you might want. The specs. Yeah, yeah. got to be specs. Gotta, there's got to be a... This, you've got to know what the scope is and you've got to know what the specs are inside the scope. Yeah. Um, Just jumping to farming. and Oh, we, and the other thing about those cows we were talking about, oh, yeah. mate, let me advise you, the reason I wanted them there was... Yeah, yeah, the why. And if you give me the why, yeah. much better chance. Yeah, good call. But notice I left the feedback until we'd done 50 other things and then just flipped it in quickly. Yeah. See, we've got to make, we've got to make non-productive, non-constructive feedback incidental and well-timed, and not not over not overwork it. So that so is that? And I've got to get Charlie. That that was much better where you put him this time. Yeah, a bit. A, 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 um, Charlie, uh, what's see, the word? Dopamine transmits in your brain, which is the pleasure. It's a pleasure chemical. Yeah. Dopamine. It's a reward. It's in your brain every time somebody thanks you for something. Yeah. And every time somebody, and you tick it off your list. Well, I guess there's much more chance it'll happen again in 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 the much in the way agreed more. way. If if much the previous much. time, even though it might not have been done, but there was an acknowledgement and thank you, well done. Yeah, good call. Absolutely. Tell me, um, before we wrap it up, Alan, farming and farmers. Yes. Again, I sort of mentioned it before. Yeah. You're really pleased that you're in the world of farming and have made such an impact on so many farming families. Um, whether it's sort of like, I don't know, conflict negotiation, human behaviour, all those, succession. Maybe. Oh, of course. Gee whiz. Lots of succession. Can we, can we, can we finish on that mm. and, and make it a... I know it's a very... Big. Big. And it's a misunderstood and the wrong focus. Can we talk about that? Succession, the, not just in the farming world, but in the... If we're talking family business... The focus is too late. There's no point having an argument about a will or asset distribution. Succession starts the moment a child's born, and Charlie, your brain, your best chance to program their brain to do good conversations later in life and to be good learners and good contributors is the first four years of their life. And I just say to parents, whatever behaviours you want that child to do, just make sure you're doing them in front of them the whole time between zero and four. Because that's where the fastest learning, the fastest brain development, and more neurons are switched on in those first four years. And people go, oh, well, you know, we've got to get the kids the good genetics. So I go, forget the genetics. It doesn't matter what the genes are. You can develop a completely new human being in that first four years. What if we miss that four year, <laughs> four year window? Then if you if you miss it, you kick yourself in the butt. <laughs> yeah. Solidly. So uh, don't, the, the answer is, watch this, the answer, Charlie, is don't miss it. Don't miss it, exactly. Don't miss it. So if you miss it with your last child, have another child and then practice if, on that. If necessary. <laughs> or, or, but if you miss it with the last child and the child's what age? Five. Five. Um, pretend it's just been born. Yeah. Because it's not too late. No. See, the bra- we used to think that the brain deteriorated after about 25. We now know that's not true. Mm. Yeah. The brain will continue to grow and learn and develop whatever we continue to grow and learn. Yeah. Any more quick tips? I know, and I'm going to say quick, I'm a bit tongue-in-cheek because there's probably no quick trip tips, but any more things that farming families can think about regarding succession? Yeah. Just yeah. as a Every decision we make, we have to make with the question, what is it that we all need
what is it that we all need that if you said it, we would all look at you and go, yes, of course. Now, too many people do individual decision making. Stop deciding before you discuss. Don't make unilateral decisions and talk about it before you need to decide and listen carefully. But it's not what you want or what I want, it's what we want. Yeah. We're all in it together. I guess a, 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 a patriarch, I'm just going to use that example, might think they know what the family, what's best for the oh. family. Do you think that could ever happen, Charlie? I don't, I don't <laughs> oh, think look, that's, it's just, that's just, probably just a, least, imagine, that's imagine. That's the least relevant question for the day. <laughs> How ridiculous <laughs> do you think a patriarch could do that? Charlie, I mean, that's, what's up with you? <laughs> what a Have silly, a water, what a silly line of questioning that is. Yeah. Um, Again, it's a it's a it's a whole other podcast probably, but a, a patriarch has you know is a uh, is not budging. Yeah, you know, uh, families are yeah. struggling to yeah. have any the, formal discussions. The, the 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 reason for that is they made a unilateral decision in the interest of their own point of view. Yeah, and we're going to stop it. Mm. Two thousand years, Charlie. Human beings are doing that pattern. Mm. And it ends up in war. And we still have more, more war on the planet than we have had at any point in time. In so history, we're, we're not quite as smart as we think we are. No. Right? Um, so lots of conversation. Make it early. Make it inclusive. And focus on common ground and agreement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Alan, I think we better leave it there. We have blown out, um, but uh, for very good reason. We're going to do a little quick 10-minute Q&A for our Patreon members, and if you're not already a Patreon member, <laughs> sign up to for $10. Immediately. 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 I like that. Yeah. That's very direct. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. So what you might want to do is jump off this. Yeah. Yeah. We should, I wish we had a little we'll, button. We'll, we'll still be here. We'll be here. <laughs> Don't just sign up immediately. I might be, if I can hang around till five, I might Contrary get a champagne. Contrary to what you believe, you can multitask. <laughs> Listen to us and we'll keep talking. And just remember that I'm trained in medical hypnosis. And while you're doing something else, I'll just... Hypnotise you. You'll keep it. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to use it. We'll have to use a video for that. So jump on charlieonnett.com.au, um, click on the Patreon button and sign up for ten dollars a month, and you'll get Alan's Q and A's, all sorts of um, all our guest Q and A's. You'll also get a monthly webinar with our, a guest per month and a bit more of a deep dive. It's good right. value and a few awesome. other things, a few videos and other stuff. Alan, right. thank you for um, for your time. It's Thanks. been an honour, and I'm Enjoy. really glad. I this is, you, you've been on my mind for some. Um, some years now as a as someone who I'd like to interview and I've, it's been a pleasure to be in your happy place here mm. on the veranda on the balcony mm. overlooking such a wonderful thing and no doubt it's your, uh, no wonder it's your happy place because it is a delight it's getting a bit fresh isn't it it's cool how, how, how's, how's, your, how's your and we've got a storm coming in yeah we have we've actually been lucky we haven't had any too much drizzle on us no, but um, there has been a little bit of rain but Alan always a pleasure I, I, I quote you often and I think of you often given what we we learnt all those years ago and it's all still relevant and as I get older it becomes more and more, more relevant yeah, and more, more conscious of that so I thank you I, um, I cannot have a conversation with someone now without sort of like just going to think about the, the where, path where's my the path, the path. <laughs> the path. that's it um, we'll put we'll, the angle we'll put the tension and time Tension and oh, what was the eight? Height, oh, height. height that's it yeah tension. was there another one before you, was, was there, there is just stick pay, another one at the end there and volume so it's P and volume Path PV. Pace. Uh, pace and volume. Pace, and pace of your voice? Pace and of your... Volumes. And the volume of it. You'll notice when I was reprimanding you, <gasps> the volume's got to drop. I can hardly hear you. Yeah, I know. I had to, yes, I had to move did. in a bit and you, closer. And your face went red and you dilated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, um, let's have a little very quick break. And you've still got Thank half you of your tea that's so 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 cold now. And we'll do a quick Q and A. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much. Are you happy to turn that little chappy off there? Absolute pleasure, Charlie. And next week on the Regenerative Journey, our guest is Shanna Wan. Last year, she was awarded Australian of the Year Local Hero, and well deserved for her advocacy work in uh, through her organisation, Sober in the Country. She has a wonderful, amazing story that uh, you might have seen on the Australian story uh, now that I mentioned it and um, 
I caught up with her at her house near Narrabri. It was a long interview. It was amazing. We went here, we went there. We went absolutely everywhere. I really appreciate it that um, Shanna shared so much of her life, her regenerative journey with me. Uh, tune in next week. Shanna Wan on The Regenerative Journey. This podcast is produced by Rhys Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.